I really wanted to know more about if there was a particular book or offer that really enthusiasmed you with psychology and psychotherapy when you were starting out. Hmm. Well, when I was in high school, I was a very poor student, mostly C's. And uh, I read a book uh, called The Human Mind by Carl Menninger. It was a very old book. Uh -huh. uh, and it had uh, a lot of case stories, newspaper clippings about things people did, and then, uh -huh. and then it was a psychodynamic understanding of those people. Uh -huh. So I, I really had, I really, that book did influence me, and I, the only A I got in high school besides physical education was in psychology. <laughs> so I had a quite a I had an interest in psychology but dating back to uh -huh. to then. And then um I I ran into a professor at the University of Utah when I was there named Ernst Bayer. Mm -hmm. He was an Austrian and uh he had uh escaped from Germany to Switzerland and then to the United States, and was um, influenced mainly by Harry Stack Sullivan, mm -hmm. interpersonal, and also behaviorism was very strong in those days. Mm -hmm. In your and, college also? Uh, ah, yeah. yeah. And uh, he saw his therapy as an integration of uh, Skinner and Freud, and uh, uh, but it, it, a lot of it had to do with the idea that we were very highly likely to to want to control others, yeah. to make ourselves feel secure and safe, mm -hmm. and so language was really important. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of how we go about controlling people was learned mm -hmm. and reinforced mm -hmm. but unconscious mm -hmm. so we may not have conscious awareness of what we're doing mm -hmm. but we do it over and over again because it works yeah. and but it's motivated really by this need for insecurity yeah, yeah. that comes from just being Born. And these so he, he wrote a book called The Silent Language uh -huh. of Psychotherapy uh -huh. that was quite influential. Okay. And then when I went to graduate school, uh, I was um, first committed to behaviorism and then to rational emotive therapy and then to humanistic and particularly client-centered psychotherapy. Can you tell us a little bit how this shifts happened? You know, it's because of my mentors. I think behavior therapy, because it was the rage of the day, it was yeah. the it was the answer for everything. <laughs> you caught on and to that. I, I was a part of that yeah. convincing movement of behaviorism. Uh -huh. And then um, I, I think... Being my interest in rational emotive was driven by the confidence that Ellis had, and uh, very its very directive nature, mm -hmm. and um, it had all the answers, and that was attractive to me when I was a first uh, first year yes. graduate uh -huh. student, but. Um, uh, after a while, I didn't like having all the answers. And, and, <laughs> and uh, in a way, you went to the other extreme with client yeah, centers. Yeah, yeah, quite a bit to the other extreme, uh -huh. and that was influenced by my mentors because I was in a counseling psychology program, and it was uh, in those days really uh, in the whole program, uh, the whole profession of counseling psychology was infiltrated with Rogers. <laughs> Mm -hmm. ideas and works and mm -hmm. philosophy mm -hmm. and um, I ultimately did my doctoral dissertation on the client-centered variables 
and it came out of Carl Rogers' research group and his students, like um, Truax Mm -hmm. and Kharkov and um, Gendlin Mm -hmm. and um, so I I tape recorded a lot of psychotherapy and rated yeah. did process ratings yeah. of the the conditions. The conditions. Was this when it really started to get enamored with the research? Was this the phase? Yes, it was. Yeah. <laughs> it was. And uh, so ironically I got interested in the research outcome research through the client centered because there was a lot of client-centered research done in those days. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> I, when I took my first university position, a guy named Alan Bergen was leaving Columbia University yeah. and, uh, and was at Brigham Young University. We came the same year. And by that time, I had read an awful lot of psychotherapy research and Alan Bergen was very much in the center of the psychotherapy mm-hmm. research movement. Mm-hmm. And um, I helped him review some articles, and then we wrote a, some articles together. So my mm-hmm. f- first publication, besides my dissertation, was on spontaneous remission in adult neurotic disorders, which uh-huh. was... Uh, Argument against I think and yeah. that that sort of thing, and then um, in the, over the ensuing years, I did um, my attention became drawn to to operationalizing outcome mm-hmm. and to measuring yeah. outcome. Yeah. So then I edited a book on measuring outcome <laughs> and. Actually, my current work, which comes out of a sabbatical leave I did at an insurance company, Mm -hmm. they they had asked me to consult with them about measuring outcome routinely, outcome routinely, yeah, and that they did that because of my interest in outcome measures, yeah, and then they really asked me if I would develop an outcome measure for their use in that insurance company. That led to the OQ45, and, and then they wanted to make outcomes the center part of that was driving their patient care. Mm-hmm. So that collaboration in the business world yeah. and in the practical world of service delivery, but also the world of efficiency yeah. and accountability, yeah. you led to where I am today. Yeah, you have today. a close tie with this pragmatic side of the insurance companies, the service needing to provide uh, validation of the outcomes. Yeah. And the OQ that you developed, it's become very widely used nowadays. It's quite successful. Can you tell just briefly, if someone really doesn't know what it does measure and what it is, can you just briefly state about the OQ? Yeah. Well, I learned from my scholarship that there were thousands of outcome measures and I also learned that there were lots and lots of assessments and measures that were highly impractical and they might be good diagnostic measures Mm -hmm. and they might be good for unraveling the dynamics within a personality but they weren't efficient at measuring changes in human beings Mm -hmm. and and so I, I had a good grasp on assessment and on measures that had been used in former studies up to that uh-huh. point in time. Um, but the demands of applied work uh, forced me to develop a very brief measure. Like it, we thought it needed to be a five-minute measure. And yet what to put into that was unknown, but for sure it needed to measure things that would change, not diagnostic 
mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. So, That's for a, for example, if you take the MMPI, yeah. um, it'll have a question like, um, "I've never been arrested." Yeah. That's a good diagnostic item. Yeah. If somebody's been arrested, that that might be an important diagnostic thing, but it can't change. Yeah. Once you've been arrested, so it's not really purely based on the medical model in that sense. It's more of the psychological, right, right. client-centered model. Yeah, uh-huh. and um, then in adults, <clears throat> it's quite different for children and adults. But in adults, you you, you almost never can separate separate out anxiety and depression. People have bo- symptoms of both. Yeah. And the scales that exist may be named depression scales, but they correlate uh-huh. very highly <laughs> with uh, anxiety scales. Yeah. So I think those those two things are ever present, regardless of pathology, mm-hmm. and they cannot be disentangled. And maybe it's not important that they be disentangled yeah. because you want both to go down rather than to diagnose people yeah. you want you just want something that's going to change if mm-hmm. people are treated so it had to be short needed to contain anxiety and depression mm-hmm. then the other things that were being studied in psychotherapy outcomes were interpersonal relationships so how people got along with people mm-hmm. conflict anger loneliness um, over compliance yeah. or you know dependence that, that sort of thing conformity interpersonal conformity so we wanted interpersonal yeah. aspects not just anxiety and depression but yeah. relating and in your presentations you sorry you sort of t- talk about the importance of social support as a predictive factor of outcome yeah. this is a recent uh uh, emphasis or is it no uh, well the social support is it's r- more narrow in that it's looking at networks of relating yeah rather than whether relating's happy or not happy it's getting more at is there somebody there for me yeah. and it does have a good predictive factor yeah yeah okay yeah um, and and so but the social supports was for other measure, the ASC, mm-hmm. not for the OQ45. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the insurance companies were very interested in uh, functioning, work functioning. Yeah. Um, got to need, got to have employees. Mm-hmm. Got to take care of their mental health, mm-hmm. so that they come to work, yeah. and so that when they're at work, they do their job. Can't have depressed people. It's not good for your profit line to have people that are at half half speed. Uh-huh. So from from a societal point of view, mm-hmm. um, it's this social role functioning which society is highly invested in having running well. Yeah. So people need to go to school and get grades and get a degree and get to work and people at work need to come to work and do their job and people who are homemakers need to take care of their business of raising kids and yeah. making them good citizens and so it's so that social role idea is, is a kind of sometimes in the literature it's been called functioning mm-hmm. social functioning but it's one of those if you have if symptoms are composed of subjective discomfort or pain, uh-huh. then functioning measures have to do with doing your job, so to yeah. speak. And yeah. so I want the OQ45 to look at functioning interpersonal relationships and subjective mm-hmm. discomfort. Mm-hmm. And rather than having three tests do that, Mm-hmm. It was nice if you could shorten it and mm-hmm. boil it down into one. Mm-hmm. That's kind of ambitious, but yeah. for but we aim to track yeah. people weekly, whereas a lot of existing measures were given pre-therapy 
and you might have six hours of assessment yeah. pre-therapy. Yeah. Then they're given post-therapy another six hours. It's just but enough. you can't do you can't do those measures course, in a yeah. week on a weekly basis. So yeah. about forty-five is about the yeah. top uh-huh. <laughs> that you can have. Yeah, and um, you know I think a lot of people understand it from an insurance point of view and the co- the interest of a company to have these kind of measures. I'd like to ask you from the clinician's point of view. Um, maybe you've been asked this many times, what's the difference between applying a formal feedback like the OQ45 or just having in mind its principles and just indirectly, informally asking for it and asking for the feedback? What do you think are the biases maybe that make it more important or important to give the formal feedback? Well, I think we always and routinely are asking about it from a subjective point of view and the patient is describing it to us. So that always exists yeah. in a clinician and in a patient conversation. And pa- therapists are always putting it on a continuum from not very disturbed to... Yeah. very disturbed and maybe they're a little more interested in qualitative symptomatology like hallucinations or no hallucinations I mean that's an important thing for a clinician to overlook uh-huh. <laughs> and, um, but I think um, I think of the self-report measures like I've developed it it's more of a thermometer do you have a fever don't you um, do you have how intense is the disturbance yeah. and you're just trying to put it on a continuum and I think it's much more precise I mean when you yeah. start asking 45 things and yeah, yeah. you start rating each on a 5 point scale yeah. there's a coarse air involved but it's much more precise than the therapist can do mm-hmm. with this subjective. Yeah, especially in five minutes. So you, it, it has that value that you can yeah. get a more clear picture faster. And what about our biases that you've talked about in your presentations towards our, uh, our self-biases as good... Uh, Therapist, we think that it's a uh, it's great that people are coming to see us. Uh, they should be happy for it because <laughs> our measures, our outcomes are of course always perfect. <laughs> How do the, does the feedback, formal feedback, help in this way? I do, I do think it cuts through our delusions. Yeah. Um, if you if you see a graph with scores yeah. over time yeah. it's a little bit like behaviorism you're you know you're not looking at a specific behavior like tantrums mm-hmm. but you are looking at a, a general thing and you are measuring it and you do hope to see it go down and mm-hmm. if it's in a graphic form in a picture mm-hmm. you you can see it going up and <laughs> instead of down. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's shattering of our delusions that yeah. it's all working out or that, yeah. um, I mean, when things really aren't changing much, yeah. our subjective assessment is to focus on one good thing. We have to stay moralized yeah. and optimistic, yeah. and so we look for positive evidence, and That's we can find it. Yeah. <laughs> even people that are Too generally, much sometimes. yeah, even people that are generally worse yeah. aren't. There's a, a totally demoralized. <laughs> There's a quote you said in your presentation, which I love, is that the statistical method has no pride involved. <laughs> I guess that sums it up in a way for the helping part. Yeah. Just yeah. going to a last phase of what I wanted to ask you, we are in this year's topic of SEPI is a therapist. And um, I would w- like to, to ask you two things. 
first of all, there has been some recent research by people like Bruce Wampold and Scott Miller that the years of experience of the therapist don't seem to correlate with the outcomes. Mm -hmm. So what this would imply is that for many people, the years of training and supervision and all of this, it doesn't, we can't see that happening in their outcomes, which is quite a dramatic thing to say. So what's your take on this? Yeah, the the research literature has been clear for years on that topic. Um, there's a whole flurry of studies of level of training, first year, second year, third year, fourth year, a whole slog of studies done in the 60s, 70s, and 70s, uh -huh. paraprofessionals yeah. versus professionals, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, study after study couldn't find a difference. So that research dates way back yeah. to the 60s and 70s and is very consistent in the finding, of, yeah. lack of finding of a difference. Yeah. And it's one of the more discouraging. It's quite shocking, I think, for many of yeah. our colleagues. Yeah. yeah. And some don't want to believe it, but I think... There's such a huge body of research, and not recent research, I mean <laughs> decades of yeah, research, yeah, yeah. Yeah. that no matter how you look at it. It's there. Yeah. Now, it's also true, though, that it's possible we could design a study. Let's say you took a experienced psychotherapist who went through all their training and worked at an eating disorder clinic. Mm -hmm. And you got ten of those people. And then you found some sophomores in college, all males. Mm -hmm. And you, the patients were eating disordered. Okay. Would they be equal? I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> Uh -huh. I would, <clears throat> I would think they might uh -huh. be damaging even the uh -huh. male sophomores, yeah. you know. Yeah. So we could set up studies that would show a difference, but ethics and common sense, yeah. you know, be like having a college freshman do marital therapy with chronically disturbed couples. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, or having having a college student with no experience mm -hmm. treat a family, yeah. dysfunctional family, and do family therapy with them versus family therapists. So, so people have not done unethical research that mm -hmm. could show these differences. the differences at the extremes. Yeah. Uh, but at this non-extreme level, it does seem to show that years of experience don't correlate. Yeah. Yeah. So in our own research, all, all we can find is that it speeds it up for the patient. Yeah. And if you look at their OQ45 scores, yeah. the ones seeing the student therapists have more variability. Yeah. So there's a rougher, <laughs> it's a rougher course uh -huh. to the end, so and it takes more sessions. But we can't find a difference. That's very interesting. We can't find a difference at the end. Yeah. Uh huh. Another thing, and then and that yeah. just I think that just reinforces that the it's the patient that determines the outcome. Mm -hmm. And I see I do supervise graduate students all the time, and and um, they make a lot of mistakes. And the patients that see them know their students, and they're very forgiving. <laughs> and they almost help them do therapy. <laughs> the ther if they're not quite doing it very well, the, uh -huh. the patient actually, I think, helps them. So the along, the, I mean, the major part of it is the client. Clients a big, yeah, it's a big part of how it turns out. Uh -huh. You have written, and I would like to finish off also with this: that we should encourage research focused on empirically supported therapists. Can you elaborate on this idea? Yeah, we there are some therapists who consistently have better outcomes than others and we need to tape record them and mm -hmm. um, 
see what they're doing. Yeah. And um, like I see in students, there's huge variability before they even take their first class. Mm -hmm. There are some students that are naturally gifted, gifted, and some, and I don't think we select those. Yeah, yeah. In, uh -huh. and in our program especially, we're not just selecting psychotherapists. We're training psychologists, and yeah. half of our students are going to be neuropsychologists, and they're going to do assessment for. Uh -huh. They're not going to help a single person. Yeah. They're not in there to help. They're yeah. in there to. <laughs> test, diagnose, yeah. uh, and, but um, we need to, we probably ultimately need to find a better way to select mm -hmm. students. Yeah. It's hard in America because yeah. like, we're training psychologists, we're not training psychotherapists. Yeah. And, uh, but psychotherapy programs like in Europe, yeah. could do a much better job of selecting people yeah. in. Then, <clears throat> then it's also true maybe that it would be nice if they could be selected for who they're going to treat, which is very hard to say, who they're ultimately going to treat. Uh -huh. but, you know, I, I bet if you wear an earring in your nose and dye your hair purple that you do a better job with drug addicted uh -huh. teenagers than if you <laughs> dress like this <laughs> and have short hairs. But so I mean there's room for this diversity because yeah. the patient clientele is diverse. But yeah. But at the at the broader level. Yeah. Yeah. So just one last question. Aiming at the clinician, the psychotherapist Lambert, not the researcher Lambert. I, I finished off all my talks with this question. I'm really interested to know your answer to this, which is, what advice do you wish you would have received when you were starting out as a therapist? Well, I think the best advice I did receive was I had a supervisor named Bob Finley who um, gave us a, a list of simple rules mm -hmm. to being a psychotherapist, okay. or simple rules for simple folks. <laughs> and uh, it had uh, about ten suggestions, and they were all paradoxes mm -hmm. and uh, very hard to understand for a first-year student. And the very last one on the list was <clears throat> rules are made to be broken, so start with these. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Zen and, training. <laughs> yeah, it was Zen training. You know, like some of his rules would be never answer a question that you didn't ask. Never ask a question that you don't know the answer to. <laughs> and you'd be looking at mind boggled. <laughs> and why was this so helpful to you? It made you really reflective and contemplative about what it meant and what real helping was. And uh, I think. I, I think there's a lot of wisdom in it, and maybe, maybe you can have guidelines, but you shouldn't hold to them too closely because there are always exceptions to yeah. the rules. And you should, I guess, it's another way of saying you don't be rigid yeah. <laughs> and yeah. be paradoxical and be. But I think I got really good training. Uh, and I think I got good advice, but I, <clears throat> I, I just in that same paradoxical way, yeah. and in the client-centered way, I, I think advice is overrated and uh, shouldn't be followed. <laughs> 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 and so I, so I don't 
think anybody could have. I mean, you learn these things, right? Uh-huh. And I, I, when I started, I thought, I thought the person would talk to me, and I'd make some wise comment, and they'd go away, uh-huh. cured. Uh-huh. <laughs> so maybe I mean, but somebody could say that's not the way it works, <laughs> but that doesn't mean I'd give up the hope that it would be that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Michael, thank you so much. Yeah. I had such a great time. Thank you. Thanks for interviewing me. Mm-hmm.